Kayla, is, is um, Cassie around next week or is she out? try and start talking to these other people, see who else wants to play today, yeah.
Good morning. Good morning. Let's have a seat, and uh, I'll do a few announcements, and we'll get started. Well, good morning, and welcome to Branch of Hope. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you guys all here today, this morning. Uh, I do have a few announcements. Uh, the first, that we have a session meeting today. However, we have several interviews beforehand, so a little caveat to that. We have uh, interviews till around midnight tonight, so uh, that's what it kind of feels like. So, um, uh, Scott, get ready. Uh, we got a lot, of, a lot of meetings, a lot of um, interviews. There we go. Okay, so the first thing that I will announce is that we are having a fellowship barbecue. Uh, obviously, we have that each month, but we are in need of help for that. So if you're interested in being a blessing to our congregation, uh, please contact Karen Valdir. She's looking for help on a regular basis uh, as another great place to serve. Uh, one of the things that we always want to encourage, and obviously we're pressing this each Sunday, is a place to serve. If you find yourself that you're not serving in any capacity in our church, we'd love to have you guys be involved. Uh, so another place to be involved would be our youth group that meets on Monday nights. Uh, if you're interested in, in serving our youth here at the church, and we also have a welcoming committee uh, where people who uh, can welcome people, uh, give a, a smile or a hug, and just kind of welcome people to church. So those are three areas. If you're interested in the youth group, contact Mike Doobie. That's youth at branchofhope.org. Or the welcoming committee, uh, you can contact Florian or Dan Lampkins, and their email is m1rabbit at aol.com. All right, I have a few announcements, and then we'll talk about our upcoming events. The first one is that we have women's prayer groups here at Branch of Hope. So if you're interested in being involved with that, please contact Jen Vigiano. It's just a great place for women to get to know each other in our church on a deeper level. We also have our new home groups that are forming right now. Uh, if you're interested in being involved in home groups for members, we want to encourage you to sign up in the foyer. Uh, this is a, a wonderful time when you can meet every other week. Uh, with people in the congregation to kind of get to know them and fellowship, uh, as well as study God's Word and share life. We also have our photos for the directory that we're creating. Uh, Dan uh, Lampkins and Larry Jones. Uh, Larry's not here today, uh, but Dan will be taking pictures on the other side of our building. Uh, please, we need those pictures, if you're a member here, for the directory. We have some upcoming events. The first is that today is our last new members class. So those of you who have been going to the new members class, today's the last day. Hey, and there's much celebration. Um, there's also a youth group fall kickoff, which Mike Doobie asked me to have incredible enthusiasm. <laughs> Who's excited for a youth group? I don't know. I tried, Mike. I tried. I couldn't. Yeah. Um, they're classic carnival food, games, pizza, just a lot of fun, and that's where all the parents for the youth, uh, they're invited to come as well. Uh, youth, you don't have to come, but the parents, you're welcome to come. No, I'm kidding. Uh, everybody is here together, youth group, uh, the youth, the students, and the parents who want to encourage people from our church to come and be a part of it. Invite your friends, siblings are welcome, but please RSVP to uh, youth at branchofhope.org. We have a game night on the 17th here at 7 p.m. Uh, that'll be a, a fun time to contact Jacob Trimper for that. We have our Beacon Light Meals Ministry where we feed the homeless uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, and on the 19th, we will be collecting, um, you will be collecting your pans and recipes and we'll be making that announcement and then you'll return it the following week. So prepare for next week. We also have our Serve Our Seniors Youth Group event uh, where the youth will be serving our seniors, that's an appropriate name, but that will be on the 20th, so join in the annual Serve Our Seniors Day at Youth Group. Uh, we would love to have you guys involved in that. We also have our Tacos and Talents Night. Do you guys remember that? Those of you who have been here for a while, Tacos and Talents Night. Submit your talent to present. That will be on October 15th. Uh, Breakdancing is encouraged and welcomed, I'm sure. Uh, please uh, make a note of that. I think you can contact Shannon Trimper for that. And I think with that, that's it for announcements. So let's uh, prepare our hearts for, uh, take a moment to prepare our hearts for our time with the Lord. Our call to worship comes to us from Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. Hear now the word of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Thus for the reading of God's holy and perfect word, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are truth, and in you we celebrate your goodness and glory when all around us fails us. Nations plot and rage, empires fall, city-states come against oppressors, and terrorists attempt to topple governments. Yet throughout it all, you stay the same, and you have planned accordingly, not because of what you knew to happen in the future. Because of all this, all that we see is a part of your good plan to bring about your glory and the redemption of many peoples through Jesus Christ. And just as you are in control of the world's events, we know that you have planned and chosen us in you before the foundation of the world was set. In your love, you chose from among totally sinful people, some that would be redeemed while passing others by. We celebrate that your decision wasn't based upon anything in your chosen people, or anything that you foresaw we would become. We are all hostile to you, as the rest of mankind is, but you simply loved us. How wonderful and majestic is your love. Why you didn't love everyone is no mystery to us. What is so mysterious is why you chose to love any of us in the first place. This is more than humbling. And as such, we know that there is nothing good in us except that which you have given and chose to do through us. As such, Lord, let us take a moment right now in the quietness of our own hearts, acknowledging our sin before you in repentance. Father, it is good to confess, because according to your word, that as we confess our sins to you, you are always faithful and always just to forgive us of all our transgressions. Your word tells us in 1 John that this is true. It is because of Christ and Christ alone that you are just in forgiving us, having placed upon him all our sins. And for this we cry out in thankfulness and adoration and wonder. And in that name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Luke 24, 46 through 47 states, And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. As our call to worship states prophetically, we can confidently state that Jesus has come from the line of David as a righteous branch, reigning as king and dealing wisely, executing justice and righteousness in the land. For the Lord is our righteousness. Because of Christ and Christ alone and his work on the cross for our behalf, he took upon him our unrighteousness, as it states in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the best news. For through Christ, we have been reconciled to God. If you believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead, if you trust in the work of Christ alone for you on your behalf, if you know that you cannot live a sinless life, but instead Christ lived a sinless life for you and was raised from the dead, having victory over our sins, then I declare to you what Scripture clearly declares, that your sins have been washed away.
Good morning. So, this Sabbath day's congregational reading is Lord's Day 44 of the Heidelberg Catechism. I will read the question and we will respond together with the answer. Before I do that though, I've been asked to remind everyone that to my right, y'all's left, in the library is the tithes and offering box since we'll be dealing with tithes and offering coming up, and this is part of prepping for that, especially with covetousness, spoiler alert, just so you know where it is so I don't forget to do it. All right, question 113. What does the 10th requirement, sorry, what does the 10th commandment require of us? That not even the slightest thought or desire contrary to any God's command should ever arise. But can those converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? No, and this life, even the holiest, have only a small beginning of disobedience. Nevertheless, with earnest purpose, they do begin to live, not only according to some, but to all the commandments of God. If in this life no one can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God have them preached so strictly? First, that throughout our life, we may more and more become aware of our sinful nature, and therefore seek to avoid those things which are forgiveness of sins, and righteousness in Christ. Second, 
that we may be zealous for good deeds and constantly pray to God, the grace of the Holy Spirit, that he may more and more renew us after God's image. Reach the goal of perfection. Very good. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, our God, please hear our prayer on account of Christ Jesus, who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us for all violations of your commandments, including violation of this 10th commandment. Lord, we know that this commandment is a root of sin in us from your word. We know that covetousness produces all kinds of uncleanness. Keep us from covetousness, we pray. Lord please, us, Lord, please make us zealous for good deeds, which include the proper use of these tithes and offerings to be collected and that have been collected and that are entrusted to the deacons under the session for stewardship under Christ. We know that this is your money, Lord. We ask that you would guide us in how we would provide for your people, for the world around us, for all those who name your name and for those yet to. Lead us by the Holy Ghost to minister and help those in need that you bring within our charge and that you bring to us even in visiting, if that be your will, and that we may glorify you in this and all that we do in your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is the time in our service where we go before the Lord together with prayers and petitions. Um, if you would like to have prayer, if you have anything in need of prayer, please email prayer at branchofhope.org. We'd love to pray for you. So be encouraged to do that. No prayer is too small. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we need you. We cry out to you to answer our prayers, not knowing how we should pray but trusting in our great high priest who intercedes for us. We ask humbly that you would hear our prayers today for our congregation. It can be overwhelming at times to pray for such need. Some of us are going through so much in life right now, our family here, and as such, Lord, we must take this work of prayer seriously and petition to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, for these individuals to which we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace this day, which finds us celebrating you and remembering your great work on our lives. We do celebrate the freedom that we have to come before you in worship. We pray for those leaders in authority above us, Lord, that we convict and challenge and encourage them to see your gospel truth. Lord, we lift up our elder board, our deacon board, and all those on staff at Branch of Hope and those volunteering currently, Lord. We ask that we would do so, that we would serve you, not because we have to, but because we get to, Lord. Lord, we lift up specifically the needs in our congregation. Uh, Lord, Linda Peruca's sister, we lift up to you, Lord, um, in earnest. She's on palliative care now due to, due to stage four kidney failure and is on dialysis, Lord. We lift up her up to you, and we pray that you would... Um, Draw her to you, Lord. We pray for Renee, son-in-law of Dan and Angela Gutnick, who has a brain bleed. Lord, he's off the ventilator and starting eating, but the cause has not been found. So we pray, Lord, for the physicians to find this cause immediately and to be able to correct it. We pray for Stephen, nephew of Florian Lampkins, who's in the hospital with COVID. And though he's still in the ICU, he's healing slowly. We pray for continued healing and for his young family. We lift up Aaron Ruslan to you, who is suffering from severe back and hip pain constantly, Lord. Please, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, remove this pain. Give him relief and a, a proper diagnosis to find treatment. 
We pray for Angela, Andrea Lucero's sister, who still has the abscess in her abdomen, and she needs surgery, but elective surgeries have been put on hold for now, Lord. We pray that she can get treatment soon. And we lift up Bridget Morrow to you, Lord, who has a surgery date for her second hip replacement on the 14th. We pray that this day would come quickly for her, Lord. It's so soon. We pray that she would get medical clearance for the surgery and that she would have no complications from a recent bout with COVID. Lord, we do celebrate as a congregation the pregnancies of so many. We pray for their safe pregnancies of Miranda Braden, who's due in October, for Shannon Trimper, who's due in December, for Cassidy Reeves, who's due in March, for Avery Duby, who's due in November, and for Stacy Bonds, who's due in February. And we thank you for these wonderful women, and we pray for the children that you are developing, that you are knitting together in their womb. Keep them healthy and strong. We pray for those battling dementia and Alzheimer's disease, Lord. We pray for the safety, peace, and comfort and wisdom for their families who are ministering to them, specifically for Monica, Susanna, Donald, and Mamika, for Carolyn, for Rosie, and for Fred, for all those, Lord, that are struggling in this area, and for the family members who are ministering to them. Would you encourage them, help them to continue to fight this good fight and to minister properly, Lord, through your word. We pray for those battling cancer, which is overwhelming, Lord, on how many in our congregation are battling cancer. But we know that if there are those in our congregation who are battling as such, Lord, how many people in this world are battling? Lord, that is, this is the true pandemic. And I pray, Lord, that you would heal those specifically on this list. Lord, for Chris, father of Rachel Krikak, Lord, that you would heal him that you would encourage him for Elva, mother of James Howard, for Julie Herzl, who's battling advanced cancer, for Kalea and Noah Avery, who are just seven and five years old, who are battling cancer, for Gloria and Anorfo, Rosie Bowden's family, who are both battling cancer, for Andrew Lucero, for Karen Clay, for Lindy, Luann Shaw's daughter, for Rex Monson, who has completed his fourth round of chemo, and for Tiffany, cousin of Albert Miranda, who is battling cancer. Lord, let us not read this list without having some sort of emotion for our family members and for those family members here who have extended family. Give us a heart of compassion for them and give us a trust as we pray that you have them in your plan and that you are sovereignly in control and working through all of this, Lord, in which we are confused by the mystery of this, but let us trust you and what you're doing. Lord, we pray for Josh Lyon in the ministry at Carson OPC. And we pray for Dr. Jim and Jenny Knox in Uganda. We pray that the Joy Hospice patients would seek necessary care despite the COVID. In all these requests, we lift these up to you, Lord, humbly. And we ask that you would answer them in your timing according to your will. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
seated. Good morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 13 to the, uh, the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13, hear now the word of God. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thus far the reading of God's word, let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that by your Spirit you would help us to glean from this letter the very words of our Savior ministering to this little church. We pray that, Father, you would minister to us, that we might follow their example, and that we might come into a keener and greater and more deep understanding of what it means to be held in your hand. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a former elder of our church moved out of state, as they are wont to do these days. This was many years ago, and um, he and his wife had a very difficult time finding a church. He not only was an elder in the church, he was somebody I went to high school with. We, we had been friends for a long time. And uh, so they would go to churches and, and worship and fellowship with, with really dear brothers and sisters in Christ, but they couldn't seem to find a church that they were comfortable with doctrinally, uh, the, the liturgy, uh, just dynamics in the churches that they visited just were like, yeah, we just don't really, don't really want to commit. Picking a church is, is serious business. I think sometimes we do that too casually. I, don't, I think it should be serious business, and I think it can be a very difficult thing to do. Well, one morning, this elder friend attended a, uh, a political meeting in his city, and there was a pastor there who offered a prayer and the prayer kind of picked his curiosity. There was something about the prayer that he, that he liked. So he and his wife found this guy's church, and they started attending this church. Now, I just have to say, I think interestingly enough, the denomination that that church was part of was also something that my elder friend wasn't entirely comfortable with. He, he kind of felt like, yeah, this denomination, they're part of it's a little, a little unorthodox. Not, not Christian, but you get the idea. It was like not something that he was like, yeah, we have found, you know, where we want to be. But there was a, uh, a pastor there, the one that offered the prayer. He was in his 70s. And apparently this pastor was still a student into his 70s, which we all should be, right? We, I mean, semper reformanda. You're always reforming, whether you're an individual, whether you're a member, whether you're, whether you're the church, or whether you're the pastor, you should always be reforming, always growing, always being sanctified. And apparently that was true of this pastor. He was in the Word, studying, praying, and he had gone down a path where he had a, a deeper, richer understanding of the grace of God, the love of God, the law of God. It was, he was moving in a direction that my elder friend kind of could hear in his prayer. 
But this guy really understands what it means to be under God's grace. I mean, there was something beautiful about that. And my elder friend and his wife decided that they would join that church. Sadly, shortly thereafter, the, the pastor of that church succumbed to cancer, and he passed away. And, um, and apparently, he was kind of retired, and I don't know what he did during his normal career, but he, he and his wife both had, both had a pension, and so the church didn't have to pay him very much. And the church is small, and so they're having a hard time finding somebody else. They just can't afford to pay somebody to be the pastor of that, of that church. Add to that now, this, because of where the pastor kind of took this church, they're thinking about leaving that denomination. And so there's a lot going on in this little, little church. Now, last week, I wasn't here, as I am want to not be here. And I was preaching at that church. I was invited, and I spent a few days with my, my wife, and I spent a few days with this former elder and his wife and preached at that, at that church. It's a very small church, Most, mostly elderly saints in that church. Yet at the same time, as a result of the grace of God, I think as a result of the faithfulness of this pastor, even though it's a small church of elderly people, there was like this renewed joy and excitement that you could feel in this congregation. Like they were singing and talking and the whole thing was like, wow, the grace of God is at work here. I have to say, if, you are, if you're following you know, Revelation, the, the, the angel of that church, the pastor of that church, I think really did his job. But the Lord took him home. Now, I, I open with this because having gone there and watched that take place and then coming back home into my study and starting to study, you know, our seven churches in the Revelation, it kind of struck me that that church is similar to the church at Philadelphia. It's, it's small. By worldly, measurable standards, people wouldn't walk into that church and say, well, something big is happening here. Boy, this place is really hopping. That is not what you, you would walk in and it's, you know, like I said, there, it's a small in number and elderly. And, it, you know, it's, it's not like things are hopping at the Christian center down the road. It's like, it's, you, you, but if you have eyes to see, and my elder friends saw it, something great is taking place there. My friend, you know, they talked about all the churches they visited, mega churches, you know, where it's really loud and, you know, it appears that a lot is happening. But, you know, this guy's been in the faith for a long time and he would watch and he could tell even though there's a lot of hoopla in this building, it is lacking true biblical content. It's just not where he and his wife wanted to be. I think it can be said of this little church in Arizona that they, quote, as we read just a minute ago in this passage, have little strength. They have little strength. Yet someone once said, they serve the God of disproportionate results. Now, none of this is an argument for churches, I think, to remain small. I think we should always be seeking to grow and evangelize and reach out. But it is an argument, I think, against pure pragmatism. De determining your success in ministry or your pursuit in ministry apart from the unwavering commitment, as we will read in this passage, to the word of God and to the name of Christ. That is really apparent in that little church. That was happening here in the church of Philadelphia, and churches should be praying, all churches, that they have the same commitment. Let us go now to the text and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. 
A little bit about this city, Philadelphia. It was founded by um, Atlas II a couple hundred years before the birth of Christ. Um, It was named out of his love and loyalty for his brother, hence the name Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. If you, if you look at where it's at in this little horseshoe of churches that we see Revelation going to, that Roman postal route, it's kind of on the bottom right, and it was, uh, the, this church was called the Gateway to the East, and it was founded to promote Hellenism, you know, it's this, the Greek culture and so forth. And about, about 17 B.C., the city was decimated by volcanic activity. So that's what's happening in Philadelphia. Also, when it was decimated, the Roman Empire came in and pretty much paid to fix everything. Now, I mention that because when the government comes in and pays to fix everything, you find yourself beholding to the government. And I think that was true of many of these little churches when you have a monster like the Roman Empire kind of governing every word, thought, and deed in your life, or at least trying to. Now, similar to Smyrna, we see very little, if any, blame given to Philadelphia. I, I think I had mentioned when we went through Smyrna that Smyrna was the only church that, re, that didn't receive any negative criticism from Christ. That was, that's an error if I said that. Um, this church also. They, you know, Jesus has nothing negative to say about the church in Philadelphia. He only praises them. Both Smyrna, by the way, and Philadelphia were under great oppression from the, religiously from the Jews and politically from the Roman Empire, which, by the way, is this recurring theme that we're going to see throughout the Revelation. These are two, the two enemies of the church, bad religion an oppressive government. Well, we see this designation uh, at the beginning, as we see in every one of these letters. This, you know, the one writing this is holy and true. Holy and true. It might seem obvious, but I'm going to state it anyway. The true head of the church must be characterized by supreme sanctity or supreme holiness. As we read in in Hebrews, holy, innocent, unstained, the the true head of the church is Christ himself. Again, maybe you're like, "Well, well, that's obvious. I think it needs to be stated. And true, holy and true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The church is to be governed by the head of the church who is holy and ever speaks the truth which we have contained in the Word of God. That needs to be a commitment. I mean, for those of you who will ever search for a church, those of you who might be listening on the radio and you're looking for a church, these are are non-negotiables for the church. Is Christ the head of this church, and is that church governed by the Word of God? If that's not the case, then you're not in a good place for your soul. We read here a reference to the key of David. So we have this reference to the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Now, if we had time, we would launch into a big study in Isaiah where we see that phrase used predominantly, but we don't have the time to do that. I'll just tell you kind of where this is going. If you read Isaiah, you see there was an evil man named Shebna, And there was a godly man named Eliakim. And Eliakim is thought to be, and I tend to agree with it, was a type of Christ. Shebna, kind of a type of the devil. And Shebna is removed and replaced by Eliakim. In the same way that at the time of the the beginning of the New Covenant, when the devil is, you know, runs roughshod and has sway over the whole world, Christ comes. It's kind of like there's a new sheriff in town. It's the deposition of the devil and the glory of Christ. That's what we see, and it is there that we begin to see this idea of doors and keys and opening and shutting. What does that mean, doors and keys and opening and shutting? Well, I mean, I guess it should be obvious to us, right? Keys and doors signify things like power, authority, 
entrance, protection, what keys and doors do, right? Keys open things, they close things, right? They keep you in, they keep you out. And so these are the types of things that keys do. What key are we talking about here? What is the most kind of prominent place in the New Testament where we see the use of the word keys? I would say it's in Matthew when Jesus is talking to Peter. The wonderful passage when he says, he's talking to Peter as the representative apostle. And he's talking about how, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And he's on this rock, I shall build my church. And then he tells Peter that to you is given the keys of the kingdom. I have to tell you as an elder in a church, that's a scary statement. Because you've got to ask yourself, well, who has the keys? Because in the verse we just read, it's Jesus who has the keys, right? He's the one who has the keys to the kingdom. He's the one who opens the door and shuts the door. But when Jesus is talking to Peter, he's talking about the church. He's saying, well, the church has the keys. Well, who is it? Which is it? Well, I do believe it's this. I think the answer is this. To the extent that the church placards and heralds Christ, it has it. If the church is not placarding Christ, if the church is not elevating Christ, if Christ is not the central focus of the church, then the church doesn't have keys to anything. But if the church is, in fact, presenting Christ and Him crucified, that is the means by which the keys function. We need to take that to heart. The church is kind of a, you look in your Bibles, the church is all over the place, and it's kind of a bigger deal than we think, and as, an, as potential elders, it should fill our hearts, you know, the elders we have and the ones we're going to have, it should fill our hearts with a little bit of fear to know that you have such a responsibility. At the same time, if Jesus has prepared a place for you, you know, and that my father's mansion, there's many rooms, and I, I go to prepare a place for you. If he opens that door, nobody can keep you out, and if you're in, nobody can throw you out. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. You know, this is a little church. Like I said, it reminded me of the church, you know, that I saw in Arizona. But this little church is not on the back burner. It's not like, you know what, you guys just go ahead and continue to exist while I take care of my big business with my big church. Jesus knows. He knows what's going on. He knows their trials. He knows their difficulties. He knows who their oppressors are. And though they're small in numbers and small in strength, they have kept his word. What a wonderful thing to hear from the Savior. I know that you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. I was asked recently, just this last week, actually, to give a testimony about a local church, not in our denomination, maybe not even technically a reformed church, you know, but they are a reforming church. And, you know, I was, I, when I was going to this interview, I was thinking, you know, I, I don't want to be critical because, you know, I mean, pastors always have something critical to say about anything, right? I go, but it's like they're for their anniversary and I'm supposed to say something affirming. But it wasn't hard for me to find something affirming because the one thing I noticed about this other church was if you go to that church, somebody up front is going to open their Bible and they're going to wrestle their way through it. And I think that's why that church has remained a church because they're opening their Bible and I don't agree with their, all their conclusions. I don't agree with all the conclusions of our own elders sometimes, right? But you open the Word of God and you wrestle your way through it, right? My Word, we have God's Word and if we're not opening it and wrestling with it, as a church, we're like people on a journey with no map, right? It's that old saying, right? I don't, know, I don't know where we're going, but we're making good time. There's just a lot of hoopla, but there's not a lot of content and direction. So you open that word of God, and if you do open that word of God, it won't take long until you are confronted with the name of Christ. And you know, as we talked before, in the Semitic language, 
The word name means the totality of the person. It's not just the name Jesus or the name Christ, but the totality of who Christ is. You open the word, and now you have Christ. Well, now churches have to make a decision. Will they, in fact, placard the name of Christ? Okay, you've opened the word. You have found the name of Christ. Are you willing to broadcast the name of Christ? Because those are two entirely different things. Sometimes I find it so disturbing when, I, when I, I'll listen to a sermon and they read a passage, and I'm like, there it is, you know, there's the, there's the redeeming word of God, and then they start talking, and they're not saying anything about the passage they just read. We are, we are to broadcast the name of Christ. I mean, Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 10, 27 and 28. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I mean, you and I both feel a little bit kind of hesitant to proclaim the name of Christ in certain environments. And yet none of us, at least in this culture, are confronted with the fear of death, right? I mean, in Hebrews, it got, so none of you have gone to the point of shedding blood. Jesus is going, look, I'm sending you guys out. And there are people who will want to kill you. Don't be afraid of them. And we, we need to muster up a little courage. We need to be able to say what Jesus kind of whispered to us. We need to look back and get on top of the roof with a bullhorn and say it. I'm not literally, because you might, people think you might be crazy, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Nonetheless, whatever the best method is, it's got to be done. And that's what they were doing. This little church in Philadelphia, they were faithful in this capacity. They knew the word of God, and they did not deny the name of Christ, even in an environment that would have been dangerous for them to proclaim it. Jesus then mentions an open door. Now, that can mean, well, it can mean one of two things, or I guess it could mean both. The door was open for them to enter the kingdom of God. I'm opening a door. And I, I don't go entirely with this, but we know Jesus refers to himself as, as the door, right? So it, it could be that. I think that's pushing it a little bit too far, but I think the door to the kingdom is one thing that is kind of a, a reasonable understanding of that text. But what you see in the New Testament, probably more than that, when you get to that open door, is the open door for a ministerial opportunity. We see the Apostle Paul saying that quite a bit. The Lord opened a door for us. And you're kind of going, okay, open the door to do what? To minister, to proclaim. This idea that God is going, I'm giving you an opportunity. You know, it makes me wonder how many times God has opened doors for us, and we just walk on by. You know, Dan got up here this morning, and he, he mentioned our, our activities that we're going to, you know, that the church has. And churches do that. We do that. We, hey, and, and some of them could be intense, working at homeless shelters or some very pious things like prayer meetings, some of them game night, you know, where it's just a, an opportunity for you to get together and sit across the table from somebody and get to know them and so forth. These are, these are things that churches provide in order for people in their church to somehow, at some level, minister or to be ministered to or to interact. That We have a whole list of them. I think last time I looked, we had like 50-something things you could do. But let's be careful not to constrain God to our list. If God opens a door, don't, don't break your bulletin out and go, I'm not really on the list here. Because he may be opening doors, and I suspect that he does, and we should walk through that door. And again, whether that's saying something or inviting someone or giving them a glass of water or whatever it might be, God opens doors, and we should avail ourselves of that when he does. Verses 9 and 10, indeed... I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. 
because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. These are two loaded verses. I, I don't know, you know, I look out and I, we, I had dinner last night with some people in our church and one of the dads, you know, I was going, you know, sometimes it's, it's tricky to give a sermon because you've got a big wide variety, you know. He's got a son who's, I don't know exactly how old his son is. He's in single digits, though, you know, eight or nine. He's like, yeah, you've got to preach to me. You've got to preach to my son. I'm like, yeah. You know, you, that's kind of a tough class to get a lesson plan for. Right? So I don't know to what extent you're like doing your revelation homework, but these two verses are loaded verses. What in the world are we talking about here? Well, we have the second reference to the synagogue of Satan. What is that? Who are they? The synagogue of Satan is a religious community of Jews, he's, he, he, you know, it's like they say they are Jews, but they're not. They, are, they got Jewish blood in their veins, but they have rejected the Messiah. So Jesus is saying they say they're Jews, but they're not really Jews. The true Jew, when Christ came, would say, yes, this is my Savior. This is the Messiah. So Jesus is making that distinction. He makes it twice. He makes it here, and he made it in chapter 2. They say they're Jews, but they're not. And it's not just that. It's like... It's not as if they're going, look, at we don't really want too much Jesus in our church. It is Jesus is supplanted by Satan. They're not a synagogue of the secular, right? They're a synagogue of Satan. I mean, the devil is looking for religious opportunities. And when churches decide, I'm going to reject Christ, it's not as if Satan pays no attention He's like, oh, uh, hey, a vacancy. There's a room to let. And that is what's happening here. Let me tell you, and what I'm saying right now is it's going to run very counter to the most popular views you're hearing today. But I think it is a very unhealthy thing for the church and for the people that we're going to seek to minister to to think that anybody has a special place in God's covenant by virtue of the blood flowing through their veins. That, and again, you, know, you can ask me about that in Q&A, but that is the predominant view. Does the Bible teach, what does the Bible teach about the ethnic Jew? You know what the Bible teaches about the ethnic Jew, the, the Jew who you know, can trace himself back to Abraham? The Bible teaches that there will come a time when they will come to faith. And it'll be, Paul says, and it'll be like life from the dead. I mean, there's this glorious plan that it's not as if God said, look, you guys rejected Christ, so I'm going to annihilate you like I did Sodom and Gomorrah. No. Matter of fact, what he's saying is in the future and throughout the course of history, these people will come. And can you imagine how glorious that would be? Because the people that you and I, some of us, maybe, I don't know if you do, who enjoy on the radio the most, so many of them are Jewish. Can you imagine Ben Shapiro coming to faith in Christ? Because we'd hire him here. <laughs> or Dennis Prager. If they brought their knowledge of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and God opened their eyes to see what Jesus said, that it's all about him, can you imagine? And I think that's what the Apostle Paul was so excited about. So we are not to go look at it as a person because of your ethnicity, because of your heritage, you have a special place. No, we are to evangelize. We are to love them. We are to pray for them. We are to bring them into the kingdom, recognizing that, that their place in the kingdom is something that will be glorious to the advancement of the Great Commission. But in this context, they are enemies of the church. Jesus, Jesus speaking to them said, your father, he's talking to Jewish leaders in John chapter 8. He says, your father is the father of lies, the devil. So they need Christ, simply put. Well, now we have this other portion of this passage that I have to say, I read it and I read it. This idea that I will have them come and worship at your feet. What does that mean? 
because I'm not comfortable with that idea. I don't, want, I don't want anybody worshiping at my feet. And I should be uncomfortable with it. You know who else was very uncomfortable with it? Peter was uncomfortable with it, right? When it's like Peter shows up and, and, and they're, you know, I think it was Cornelius falls down to worship at his feet and Peter goes, whoa, whoa, you get up. I'm just, don't be bowing down before me. So I think, I think any understanding that, that we might have of this passage that the Lord is going, look, they're going to come down and worship you would be a misunderstanding of this passage. This is one of those, one of those passages that if you don't understand the Old Testament, as it, it's, it's hard. The Old Testament is big and thick and it's got a lot in it. And if we don't understand the Old Testament, we won't get the irony of this passage. So let me just briefly explain where this is probably coming from. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there's a promise to Israel that the enemies of Israel will find themselves in a subservient role to Israel. God is kind of, these nations are going to attack you, but instead of attacking you and instead of succeeding, there will come a time when their houses will be your houses. There'll come a time when their cattle will belong to you. There'll come a time when they will recognize that you are the people who I love. So you have that promise given to Israel. Now, well, now, you, now you've got it kind of turned on its head here. You see, see what's, what this passage is telling us is that in a very ironic way, the very promises that we read in the Old Testament that were given to Israel are given to the true Israel of God, those who've called upon the name of Christ. And again, I don't think this is a matter of us kind of going... Well, are they going to worship me? No, I think it's more like what we see in Philippians chapter 2, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what's going to, I think, happen. And I think that's what he's talking about here. And then he goes, look at it. And, and I don't want to put an emphasis in the Bible where it, you know, because the Bible doesn't tell us, what do you emphasize, right? When you get to this word, say it a little louder or say, you know, but I'll do that just for now. They will know that I have loved you. They will not think that my redeeming love is extended to them by virtue of their relationship to Abraham. Remember John the Baptist said, don't, don't even begin to tell me that you have Abraham as your father. God can take these stones and turn them into sons of Abraham. What we need is faith. Are you a child of faith, not a child of blood? All right, well, moving on. Uh, due to the person, we get, now it's going to get even thicker. Okay? Due to the persevering faith, he's like, well, because you have persevered, this church at Philadelphia will be kept from, quote, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. All right? What is that? What do you think he's talking about there? Because you have persevered, I am going to keep you from the hour of trial which is about to come upon the whole world. Well, I, um, I don't want to sound snarky or snippy or any other word to describe somebody who needs to really approach this kind of lovingly. But I have to tell you, and I've got about, I have about, I have the bibliography for those of you who want it. I've got about 60 books that I'm referencing as I go through. And this, this verse is one of those verses where the most erudite scholars that I respect in so many different ways just go into the proverbial ditch. Where I'm going, what? What? You all know the story about how I was preaching through Revelation, right, 30 years ago, and I got finally to a place where I'm like, I have no idea what I'm talking about here, because I relied on a commentary, and then I'm like, I don't, I don't see this. Sermon's over. Nobody really complained that we ended early that day. This is one of those verses where you're going, I could say what these commentators say, but I don't see it, and I'll ask you if you see it. The most common view today, not historically, mind you, not if you go back a couple of hundred years, but the most popular view today 
The view that you're going to see, you know, in books like The Late Great Planet Earth or the Left Behind series and all the movies and all that is that when he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial, which is about to come upon the whole world, is the rapture. Now, this is, I think, one of those examples where you're forcing your system to change what the Bible actually means. Because if, if Jesus is saying, I'm going to rapture you, he didn't keep that promise. He, he's writing to the church of Philadelphia. Now, according to this view, which is not a view that I hold, the rapture is not going to happen for a couple of thousand years. But he's telling them, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial which is about to come upon the whole world. But they weren't raptured. To, to me, that is a big, giant theological tamale just hanging out there. I am just going, I, I just, that just doesn't work for me. I don't think it should work for you. I think you should go, what? Well, add this to that. The very next verse, you know what Jesus says? Behold, I am coming quickly. And I add that to it. Right, so whatever was about to happen was going to happen quickly. Now, you, if you're at that church, if you're at the Church of Philadelphia and you're reading this, what do you think is going to happen? Something that you're going to be kind of protected through that's going to happen when? Quickly. <laughs> right, exactly right. Well, there are a couple of things, and I, I got to stop here. You can, again, you can ask me more about this in Q&A if you'd like. But there's a couple of things we need to learn here, both ministerially and, you know, in terms of how God is ministering to his church. And, and uh, it's a big word, but I'm going to say it and then I'll explain it. And exegetically. And that is how we study our Bible, how we read our Bible. Okay? First, tough times for this church at Philadelphia are coming. And God is going to see his church through it. And I think that is a promise that you and I can believe would apply to us as well. That he knows this church. He knows their difficulties. There is something very difficult that's about to happen. And he's going to keep them through it. I think it's a very precious ministerial promise. If I were part of that church, I would be comforted. You should be comforted. Because it's a message that he gives to his churches. Exegetically, the term the whole world does not in Scripture always, sometimes it does, but it does not always mean every last single person on the planet. Right? I mean, I can give you a whole bunch of examples. The one obvious example is when Caesar calls for there to be a census, right, in Luke chapter 2. There's going to be a census. And he says, a census taken of the whole world. Now, last time I checked, that census did not include the Yucatan Peninsula. It didn't, it wasn't, there was, South America wasn't in it. Alaska wasn't in it. The, the whole world, matter of fact, there's another verse where it says, the, you know, the apostles are there and it says, look, the whole world follows them. There are numerous verses in the Bible where the, the phrase, the whole world, and in Greek, those words are used that could not possibly mean every last single place or every last single person on the planet. And so we have to recognize biblical language when we see it. Oftentimes, when we read our Bibles, the Roman Empire is viewed as the whole world. Paul says to the church at Rome, your faith has been proclaimed throughout the whole world. We read in Acts at Pentecost that there were at Acts people from every nation under heaven. People from every nation under heaven, as the way you and I might understand it, weren't at Pentecost. It's a matter of kind of understanding the way the Bible uses language. And if you're not willing to acknowledge that, then you have a verse like this, and you can't make any sense of it at all. Well, let's move on. Finally, verses 11 through 13. Behold, I am coming quickly. 
Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think the most natural, literal understanding for the members of the church at Philadelphia when they hear that Christ is coming quickly would be for them to expect that something was about to happen. And there are a lot of other verses in Revelation that indicate the same thing. Things which must shortly come to pass. The time is near. It's said over and over and over, and yet somehow we live in a generation that has just quantum leaped this into thousands and thousands of years in the future, and I think it's exegetical madness. I think we're just kind of going, we're going to make the Bible cater to the grid of theology that we're committed to, rather than let the Bible speak for itself. I think it's most reasonable to understand when he says, behold, I'm coming. When Jesus says, behold, I'm coming, it's not his first coming, right, because he already came. But it's not his second coming either, because he's about to come. But as we had studied earlier, when the Bible talks about Jesus coming, it can mean any number of things. He can come in history to judge. He can come in history to bless. This kind of language is used throughout. And what I would argue here is what he's talking about is the cataclysmic end of the Old Covenant. Jesus had preached on that in the Olivet Discourse when they were admiring the temples, and he said, don't admire them too much because in this generation, verse 34 of chapter 24, not one stone will be left upon the other. That temple was like an emblem of the Old Covenant. And Jesus is saying it's coming to an end. It was cataclysmic. It was ferocious. It was a siege. They called it the siege of Jerusalem. The world knows this as B.C. becoming A.D. Or today, right, B.C.E. becoming C.E. Don't get me started. (laughs) That's, That's the way the world sees this event. The church sees it as Old Covenant, New Covenant. There's this New Covenant. It's international. It's the full proclamation of the redemption that is found in Christ. It presents to you and to me things that the angels longed to look at. And we have it. So the Old Covenant was coming to an end. Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, he's kind of a little bit. He's like, hey, be careful that nobody takes your crown. You know, normally when you see the crown in reference to you or me, it's promised to those who have finished the race. Right? You're going to finish the race and receive your crown. And yet in another sense, you and I already have If you're in Christ, you already have a crown. He's like, don't let them take your crown away. We have it by virtue of his promise. In the same way in Romans 8, he says we're glorified. I'm like, I'm not feeling very glorified today. But it's the promise of God. And so I can understand that in kind of what they they talk about an already, not yet sense. I don't know if we think about it this way very often. I know I don't. In a world, you know, striving for identity, right? Everybody needs to kind of find themselves and stuff. We're working so hard. Remember when I was teaching high school, we had a, an award ceremony at a high school that had about 2,500 students. And we gave an award trying to bolster their self-image, to give them an identity, to make them feel like, yeah, I am somebody. We gave an award virtually to every student in the entire school. And the only thing we created was a litter problem. Because every kid there knew this means nothing. What we've done is we have taken away this idea of telling young people, you know what? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. If 
by a creator. And you are his supreme work. The stars and the sun and the moon, they're, they're almost like in the background, but you are made in the image of God. And in our public school system, we've, we've taken that out and we try to replace it with an 8 by 11 sheet of paper saying, you're somebody. And they're like, well, who, who am I? Well, you know, well, you're an accident, but you're a cosmic accident. But, you know, at least you're fast or you're a good writer or you were really good in that play last week or something. And, and kids are kind of going, wow, you've just kind of pulled the carpet out from under my feet. I remember doing an interview with a young man uh, who wasn't a believer, and I was sharing that with him. He's like, so, you know, how, do I, how, how am I to understand my own humanity? And I said, well, first of all, you need, to, you need to understand that you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. And he looked at me like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, who's hiding this information from me? What a wonderful thing to hear. Well, so we have this identity thing. I mean, and, and we've got, those who are in Christ, you've got bags of identity. But one of the things I think we seldom think of in terms of who am I in Christ is kind of an enlisted soldier wearing the crown. I don't know if we think about that too often, and I think that's what this passage seems to be indicating. It's like, you've got a crown, don't let that crown slip off your head. You know, we read in Scripture, thinking about being enlisted in the service, thinking about being a warrior for Christ. We read in the Scriptures oftentimes of these small groups of warriors, right? right? David's mighty men. I was studying that this week, and it's like they're trying to describe David's mighty men. And they said they, they fight like a bear whose cubs have been robbed, right? Mama bear. You don't want to be robbing the cubs of the bear. That's the way. Or we read about Gideon, right? Who started out with like whatever it was, 10,000, and God's like, you got too many. And it went through a series of things, went down to 300, and they destroyed the entire Midianite army. Talk about the God of disproportionate results. And I don't want to sound, you know, melodramatic, and I think maybe actually this is just the opposite of melodramatic, but my mind could not help go to Tolkien's wonderful, you know, uh, analogy of the Christian faith in the Lord of the Rings, right? The Fellowship of the Ring. And I think of, you know, you have, I think it was uh, nine warriors who are responsible for rescuing the entire Middle Earth, right? And four of them are hobbits. You know, this idea that you're like, oh, God is going, I'm going to do something great, and I got a small group of people. You got a crown, keep the crown. Well, we're in a battle, friends, and there are people who would derail you. There is an enemy that would derail you. To, 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 to be wooed, and, you know, and as a, as a father, and I, I'm, you know, we're always on the lookout for how this might affect our own children. I'm always on the lookout for how it'll affect the young people and even old people in our own church when we are kind of captivated by worldly systems, empty philosophies, charming personalities, talented singers. I mean, is there a more beautiful song than Imagine by John Lennon? I have to tell you, I... That song comes on and it emotionally affects me and it is straight out of hell, right? I mean, not to be mean, right? Imagine there's no God. Imagine there's no heaven. Ima you're like going, wow, what are the consequences of that? So, but you're, you're looking at it, you know, if you're in a room full of people, it's kind of like, hey, you know, that and stairway to heaven. And it's just kind of like, wow, it's getting me where I want to go. It's not getting you anywhere. It's getting you where the enemy wants you to go. This idea that we can so easily be captivated by this very ambiguous greater good that is hanging out there. Hey, you got to do that for the greater good. Well, what is the greater good? Do you? Yeah. Well, I just want to challenge all of us 
that we do not for a moment give up that crown. We do not for a moment pinch just a little incense, right, to that would-be sovereign. We don't for a moment utter words of allegiance to that person who would supplant Christ, even if it's just a little word here, a little word there, a little gesture here, a little gesture there. We just do not give an inch. He says, hold fast what you got. Because if you do not do that, if you're not willing to fight, you're going to look up and your crown's going to be gone. That's the warning he's given. Let no one steal your crown. And they were in an environment where that way, we'll get into this, right? Where it's like, but wait a minute, we can't buy or sell. We can't function in society unless we bow the knee to Caesar. Oh, man. You know what? We'll get into the mark of the beast. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I'll tell you this. That if you want to know where I think the mark of the beast first shows up in terms of an action in the New Testament is when the people of the covenant, people of God say, we have no king but Caesar. They have taken the mark of the beast when they, when they have said that. No, I'm, don't worry about tattoos and computer chips and the return to park stamp at Disneyland and all these other things people <laughs> think it is. That is what it is. It is going, no, I will follow Caesar. Caesar will take care of me. Well, the glorious promise to the one who overcomes, says Jesus, is that they will be a pillar in the temple of my God. So what, what he does here throughout the Revelation is direct our hearts to the reality behind our observations. We're looking at, that's why Revelation chapter 1 starts with the glorified Christ, you, we've got all, it's almost like we need to read chapter 1 every week before we get, read any of the other chapters so we know who, in fact, is on the throne and the power and the glory and the wisdom of Christ. And our minds are ever directed to that which is really happening. You know, in that world of the Spirit of God, there's a temple. As I mentioned, that temple would be destroyed. The temple became a distraction you know, you, you're, I, there's this beautiful church up here in PB called uh, the Glass, Glass Chapel. And uh, it is. I mean, it was the architecture, architect was Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. You know, and I mean, you'll go in there and you're like, wow. And I remember witnessing to this guy, old buddy of mine, track and field buddy of mine, and he was resistant, resistant, resistant. And he finally went to like a wedding at the Glass Chapel. And he's like, hey, Vid, you call me Vid, you know. He goes, I think I found God. I'm like, you know, I was ready to like praise God. I'm like, tell me what happened. And well, oh, he's at the glass chapel, man. I'm like, wow, I better go see him. You know what I mean? <laughs> what? But it's like this distraction of this like holy environment. That's why, you know, sometimes in Reformed churches, they keep their churches as plain as possible. We're kind of fancy, <laughs> you know? But it's like no distractions. You know, I think they might overdo it sometimes. But that's kind of what's, that's where our mind needs to be directed. It needs to be directed to that which our eyes can't actually see but by faith. Because it is such a distraction. I remember going to a baseball game with some people in our church years ago. And I met this other couple, and they were believers. They didn't attend our church, you know. And we're sitting down, and they're like, oh, it's Pastor Paul. And I could tell they were like, oh, I, I've got questions, you know, a pastor. And I'm like... <laughs> All right, I guess I'm not going to be watching the game here. <laughs> you know me, I enjoy those conversations. The very first thing, number one question. So, you think the temple, temple is about to be rebuilt? Now, I don't know if you know what they're talking about. You know, the, the, the popular brand of eschatology, you have the temple being rebuilt, and then that kind of is, you know, the sacrifice. You know, Jesus is going to enter that rebuilt temple where there will be sacrifices and this and that. So, there's this temple in order for that system to work that needs to be rebuilt and I go I think it's already been rebuilt they're like no way intelligence reports like what what tell us I go well I think the temple is the body of Christ and I can't tell you how disappointed they were 
I'm like, okay, you see where there's something wrong with that, where you're more excited about the temple than you are about the temple? The rebuilt temple, you know, it's only mentioned one time in the New Testament. All the talk about rebuilding the temple, I'm going to read it to you here. The only time in the New Testament where we read of the rebuilding of the temple is in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Jesus answered them saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? And we see the commentary by John but he was speaking about the temple of his body. That needs to be the focus, the temple of his body. Now, of course, initially, what's he talking about? The resurrection, right? Three days, it's going to be a resurrection. But we have to recognize this as well, that when Jesus starts talking about his body, he doesn't stop at the resurrection. You know who else is the body of Christ? You're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. The imagery, this idea that you are going to be a pillar in the temple of God is kind of something we see throughout Scripture. I mean, it's just it's fascinating and it's glorious and it's beautiful. First of all, we read in, in Corinthians, right, that our bodies are what? Temples of the Holy Spirit. So each individually we are a temple. But then Peter tells us we're living stones, right? So we're, we're a temple. And it's like each temple is a stone being built into another temple. So you got this, if you get it in your head, you've got this building made of bricks, but each brick is its own building. And that's the image given here, that, that, that we, are, we don't lose our individuality. It's very personal. God is using us in that respect. He loves us in that respect, but we can't deny the fact that we're at the same time to be called a pillar in the temple of God. Are you a pillar in the temple of God? And what is that? Because let me tell you this, if you think, yeah, the, the, the house of God, the temple of God needs me to hold it up, I think that's a mistake. It's been suggested, and I think there's merit to it, that the kind of pillar that he's talking about are the kind of pillars that you see of the stately Roman emperors in the first century, where in those various temples you would see a pillar and you would see a bust or you'd see one of the emperors. So you got this idea, whatever it is, that you are part of this glorious structure. You're part of it. And nobody's taking it down. It can't be defaced. Nobody's, you know, they're how they're taking statues down everywhere and stuff. Nobody's going to be able to march in there and take your statue down. Because the Lord has put his name upon you. He's put the name of his city upon you. I mean, it's almost like he's going, how many ways do I need to say this? If you are faithful the glory of heaven, the new Jerusalem, and everything that is eternal and good and pure and right and redemptive is something you're part of. And so this church in Philadelphia, this little church, so small, so weak, who probably looked at themselves and said, we got nothing to offer. Jesus is looking at them going, look at all around you, things are going to go south, but I'm going to see you through it and you need to remain faithful. I mean, I, you know, you think about all the stuff going on in our culture right now. It's, you know, to be honest with you, small potatoes compared to what they were dealing with. I just feel like, you know, and I'm gonna, this is not pointing, I feel this way about myself I, and us, that we've become so fragile. We're such weaklings. You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we're like, well, I just can't handle it. You know, I mean, Jesus saying, no, I mean, you need to overcome, you need to persevere. I need warriors. I need mighty men, mighty women. Where's my 300? Keep the crown on and go to work. But ultimately, you know this, that the battle is the Lord's, and that victory is already won. We're not, we're not going, look at it, was this gonna, how's this going to all pan out? You know, Goliath is dead, right? He's been beheaded. That enemy of the, God, the covenant people of God was destroyed by the anointed one of God by himself, David, who is a type of Christ. And it now, now that we're, we're on the, the, the side of, of, the, of the mountain looking into the valley, God's going, okay, now go take that which was won by David. Well, what does that mean? What are, what's the loot? What's the spoils? It's not us being selfish. It is bringing the love of God, the grace of God, the redemption of Christ, the gospel. It is fulfilling the great commission. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
Teach them to observe all that I've commanded. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There is a usurper and you need to go to work and bring the light of Christ to every square inch of this creation. You, you are part of that temple. You're a pillar in it. Well, I just want to finish with a reading, and I won't say much about it. Because I think, you know, we've got recogni recognition that the, the battle is won, yet at the same time, we're in the battle. And I think in a, both in a very human yet at the same time, very spiritual way. Paul expresses that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 14, and we'll just end this morning with the reading of that. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. And I just want the emphasis to be here, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray as we examine and study and meditate upon and ponder this little faithful church in Asia Minor so long ago, that we would seek to imitate those things in that church which received the commendation of Jesus himself. May we ever be a church that holds fast to your word. May we ever be a church that never denies your name. May this church be filled with those who find themselves to be pillars in the true temple of the living God, and may all this be done to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall
And if you'll prepare your communion elements, we will participate in the Lord's Supper together. And truly, this is the, the heart and focus of not only the revelation, but all of Scripture. And that is that God chose not to leave us at the mercy of sin and death, but to rescue us by sending a Savior. So if you are a believer in Christ... If you have faith that Jesus died and rose again for you, then the very first thing you ought to do is be baptized. And it is our conviction that the responsibility for these things is given to, as we talked about, the body of Christ, the church. And so you ought to be part of the body of Christ as it is expressed in local churches. You know, in the, We're studying the Church of Philadelphia right now. These are very particular places, and you should be part of a very particular place. It's, it's fun. I mean, obviously, it's the best thing is to be part of that invisible church by faith. But you know how it is. We can just get lost. And God does not want us lost. He wants us part of a body. And it's expressed by Paul saying, look at we need each other. You need me. I need you. The hand needs the foot. The eye needs the ear. We, all, we have a, a mutual dependence upon each other for our spiritual growth, and it is our responsibility to be part of that body. So if you believe, if you've been baptized and you're part of a Christian church, this is a time for you to be nourished in a very deep and profound way. If that's not you, I would say believe. Believe in the name of the Son of God. Be saved. Be baptized and become part of of his church. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would consecrate these elements from a common to a sacred use, and we do pray that as we take and eat and drink, our, our minds would be swept heavenward, that we would have a deep and rich understanding of what these elements point to, the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus who died to rescue us. We pray in his precious name. Amen. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, wrote this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, what a wondrous thing it is that you have preserved your church from generation to generation, recognizing that the faithfulness of the church, the church's willingness to persevere, to overcome from generation to generation, is a result of your presence in it. And we thank you that you have reached us and that you minister to us. And for this, we offer our praise in his name. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
how we were praying about every result. The respiratory trial. The one you said I might be uh, helping with a while back. For you, um, I don't know. I'm out of the loop on that. He never, you know. Okay, we're, are we on? We're live? Okay, th those of you who are at home, welcome. Hi, everybody. We got a bunch of people. Those of you at home, we got a bunch of people in the room here. Who are, who are, oh. All right, we're going to start our time of question and answer. And um, I've been given a hard deadline on ending this. But now I can't remember what time that was. I think it, was, I think it might be one. So we're going to shoot for being done no later than 12.50. We'll shoot for 12.50. 45 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, this is our time of Q&A. And um, I'm here with our able deacon, Daniel Adrian. I'm Pastor Paul. We um, have people in the room. Looks like we already have some questions online. Uh, those of you in the room, we go back and forth online to in the room. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll just warm up here. <laughs> kind of get... It's pretty warm. Get the juices flowing with our first question. Sure. We begin with on Anonymous Arnie. <laughs> Pastor Paul. Anonymous. Are not, yeah, are anonymous, that, exactly. <laughs> Pastor Paul, when you talked about a certain 70-year-old Christian who is always, quote, reforming, end quote, you seemed to equate continuation of reformation to simply becoming individually more knowledgeable of scriptures. I thought true reformation had to do with the aim of unifying the body of Christ in all doctrine. Are you using the word, quote, reformation, end quote, in two different ways? Um, now, what I was doing, and I, it's when I was talking about the pastor, right, I guess is what we're talking about. I was just, uh, you know, because I didn't know him personally at all, um, although, you know, when I was at that church, I met his, his wife, his widow, and you really got the impression that he was a wonderful guy in every conceivable way. But it, for the sake of the sermon, I was just talking about him as kind of as, a, as an instructor. And the fact that he didn't get dug in to something that at the age of 70, he decided, well, this is what, we've always, this is what I've always believed, so I'm not changing. And I, so I just, I do think that sanctification should affect the entirety of the person. Everything. I don't think there's any part of us whether it's the way we think, the way we behave, the way we feel, I think the totality of our person should be reforming. Uh, so, but I was only talking about one aspect of this guy in particular, because I, I didn't really know him. So. I just knew that about him. So. But that to me, I think there's a humility necessary to do that, you know, to kind of go, it's not easy to go, I, I may be, I've been reading this wrong for a long time. I, don't, I think there's, it's not just being smart enough, it's being humble enough to be corrected. Oh. So you would see there's an individual reformation and a corporate reformation. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, the supper, when I think of the supper reformata, I mean, all, all, anything that's corporate is just a combination of the individuals, right? So there, you know, there's, there are no big things there are just a bunch of little things that form a big thing. And so uh, I think that's, that's so there's no, there's no reformation in a way without like Martin Luther and those individuals who kind of got it. But then if you think about the reformation, it was thousands or more, you know, so, yeah. All right, in the room. <laughs> Look at that. you're so sneaky. All right, well, since nobody else is raising their hand. Really? Uh, well, that was like a great question by that other Arnie. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that, was a, that Arnie, that other Arnie was really smart. Yeah, see, uh, compared great to me, question, I know, yeah. but, you know, shoot. But, um, you know, actually, you know, it's interesting with the, what you're saying, you know, about that, the, your answer, and because uh, I was thinking about, you know, like the Westminster Confession and everything, and, and I think you, I, 
well, okay, maybe I should pose that as a question if you would agree with this, but if I understand correctly, there's about approximately 30,000 verses in Scripture, Old New Testament, you know, and I know it's artificially divided, you know, through time, but I would argue that uh, the Westminster Confession would be dealing with maybe what you might call the primary and most important doctrines, but I would say there's tons and tons of doctrines, possibly almost every verse might be implying a different doctrine, and, uh, and I think that... Uh, at least person I would see is that maybe a big part of the Reformation, both individually and uh, universally, it should be maybe fleshing all that out, which seems like that would take another two million years or something. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, I think that's a, uh, a worthwhile goal to at least sort of aim for. Now, uh, my question finally is, you know, because there was a lot of the talk about the temple, yeah. and I, you know, I, and I, um, my understanding is your, your partial preterist view. I'm trying to see how that would fit in with Second Thessalonians chapter two. If I'm not, I'm guessing the man of sin is Nero from your point of view. We'll get there. Okay. Oh <laughs> darn. Well. Oh, you mean like in the moment or like in well, no, weeks? No. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I think the beast. I think the number of the. I think the six 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 is likely Nero, okay. but, and I say likely because in order to make that argument, you've got to go, you have to work externally to the text. Right, right. I think, so I, if somebody, for example, you know, you, you number, you'll see in the Revelation, the numbering, right? I think five, there were five, one is now, and one is coming, kind of, right. and so you've got these numbers, and people make the argument, I think it's the sixth one, the sixth emperor, the sixth Caesar, was Nero, right. right? So you're kind of going, well, there you have it. And I, I do think that's very compelling. I do think that is likely. But if they unearth extra biblical history and we found out that Nero was actually, say, the eighth emperor, right? right. Say history is... So we'd have to go back to the one before. Yeah, I don't, yeah then I, I don't want to get stuck... I don't want my exegesis to depend upon information that's exterior to the text. Right. So even though I think it's very likely, Nero, if it turned out they had the numbers wrong in history, I wouldn't want it to affect my theology. Right. So whoever was the sixth is, but, but I would say you probably can make a pretty cogent argument that it's one of the Caesars. Well, I guess my question is uh, in regards to when we're talking about the temple, it says that whoever this man of sin is, he's going to, at least future tense in the writing of this, period, this passage, he's going to be sinning in the temple of God as if he was God himself. And I'm wondering, did Nero do that? Because, I mean, I'm the only temple I could, I, I immediately think of the temple at Jerusalem, but I don't think he ever sat there, so. Yeah, That's well, my... yeah, so again, we'll get there when we get there, but what, you, what you'll see when we get there is that you've got um, the beast out of the... You've got two beasts, right? And one tends to be more political, one tends to be more religious. And so there is a record of, of a religious figure doing what, just what you said. And so... Is that in the Maccabean period? Well, there, there is a... There is historic history tells us that Antiochus Epiphany did just that, right? He came into the temple and sacrificed a pig, I think is what he did there. And so you, you've got this kind of thing taking place. But yeah, I would say that the, um, the religious and political evil that we see in the Revelation is something that was experienced by the first century. All right. All right. Michael Hill. Who? Michael Hill. Okay. Yes. What is the covenantal status of unbelieving ethnic Jews today? Are they not in the covenant? Are they covenant breakers or something else? Who who, who is he? Who's he? Unbelieving ethnic Jews. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're all. Everybody outside of the church is a covenant breaker. I mean. You know, I would argue that, you know, that there's a universality to God's covenant. And if you are, if you are, have rejected Christ, that you are in a condition 
of rebellion against the covenant God and his covenant. You're outside of it. So, yeah, I would say that anybody, no matter what their ethnicity, who has rejected the Messiah is a covenant breaker. And unless they come to faith, will suffer the consequences of that covenant breaking. They will be, you know, um, separate from the blessings of God. And um, so, yeah, that, I think that includes Israel, today's Israel, who, the ones who don't believe in Christ. I, I don't know if it was clear, but it's hard to read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and not draw the conclusion at some level that Israel, according to the flesh, at least in Paul's writing there, has some type of future. There's something for them, right? But it's not the fullness of the covenant. I would say what's for them is the fact that they will not be decimated as a people. Now, okay, consider this. Now, in Romans, in Romans 9, you read, Paul says, quoting the Old Testament, if, if not for the seed, you would have ended up like Sodom and Gomorrah. So Paul's kind of going, look at the seed is Christ. God is preserving Israel so that the seed will come. But if that Israel's behavior, Paul's arguing, was so reprehensible at times that if it wasn't for that promise of the seed, Israel would have ended up just like Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? So that's, I think everybody sees that. So now, fast forward a little bit. Now the seed has come. So Israel is no longer kind of holding the seed. We're not, so now you're kind of going, if you're an Israelite, you're going, okay, wait a minute. You said if it weren't for the seed, we'd end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're no longer holding the seed. So are we going to end up like Sodom and Gomorrah? Because, you know, it's like Joseph's brothers, right? Dad is dead. Are you going to kill us now? It's kind of one of those things. And that's where Paul goes, no. And it's almost as if he says, you know, for the sake of the fathers and this or that, God is not going to do to Israel what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah or the Amalekites or the Amorites or these other nations that were in rebellion. Um, Paul points to himself and he's like, if God was going to do that, I wouldn't be saved. I would be destroyed. So, but it's one thing to go, God is not going to judge you as a nation. That's, that's way different than going, you as a nation are in covenant with God. Those are two huge different things. And the dispensationalists basically argue that, that today's Israel, in some sense, is still in covenant with God. And, that, and, and, that, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm pro-Israel politically. I, I tend to view that nation as kind of a, the lightest place in a dark place in our world. So I'm not anti-Israel, I'm pro-Israel, but I, don't, I would not assign to Israel the covenant blessings that we see in Genesis 12. You know, when he says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I mean, there's three things in Genesis, in beginning of Genesis 12. One is, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Paul clearly in Galatians says, that's justification by faith, right? And so we've got that promise. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Um, what's the other? Uh, there's three things there. Uh, I should know this by heart. Uh, say it again. Excuse me while I thumb through my old-fashioned Bible. Um, make, the, make of thee a great nation. Yeah, so you got get out of the country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. All right, that's one. I think Peter says that the church is a holy nation. So we see the great nation is ultimately by faith, and it's the church. Secondly, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And, um, excuse me. Let 
The third one is, I has already said, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, which as Paul says in Galatians is justification by faith. But the other one, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, I would argue is the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, that God will preserve his church. What, the, what today's dispensationalist says is, no, we need to get behind Israel because those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And so it becomes a very political like tool. And I would say that that's a mistake. I would say, no, he's talking about the faithful. And so going back uh, to the question, the, um, they are, we do not want to assign to Israel, today's Israel, covenantal status. Paul, Paul in Galatians says there, he compares them to the children of Hagar. I mean, I don't know if, what that means to everybody in the room, but if you're a first century Jew, those are fighting words. You got, you got the sons of Hagar and you got the sons of Sarah, right? The children of Sarah. The children of Sarah are the children of promise. The children of Hagar are children according to the flesh. And so Paul's kind of argument is, no, no, you, only those who are in Christ, he says, are sons of Abraham. Only those who are in Christ. So anyway, that's the status, but I know that's, I'm confident that there are people who, in my teaching of this, um, won't attend our church because they, they view ethnic Israel as a nation that still has covenantal status. And I just, I just think it's a mistake. I mean, I'm going to stand by that one. All right, in the room? Happy birthday. Yes. Former Seahawk. Um, so in the, in the end of the revelation where we were looking at the Church of Philadelphia, it says, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. I'm wondering, what is the new Jerusalem? What is that this coming? Yeah, so you've got... The description of the New Jerusalem, we'll get to in like chapters 21 and 22, you know, which, you know, it's just a, it's a big square cube. It's a cube, right? I think it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by, and so forth. Um, I, don't, I don't take that literally. I don't think there's a big cube. I think it's kind of expressing, uh, you know, symbolically you know, the fullness of God's eternal kingdom. And so I, that, I think that new Jerusalem is kind of like the, um, an expression of, of heaven, of glory. And in one respect, what's that? It's to come. Yes. And yet at the same time, at the same time, you and I are citizens of it, right? But there'll, there will be a full consummation of it so it, th those categories are very important, I think, for us to understand our Bible clearly because in one respect, when God sees you or me, he only sees the righteousness of Christ, right? So that's in one category, the category of justification. But when he looks at you and me in terms of sanctification, he sees every spot, right? So and it's, I think we need to kind of view the New Jerusalem that way too, I don't think, even though you and I are part of the, currently part of the kingdom of God, as, ex, is, as is expressed by the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth, there is not the full consummation of it. So in the same way that you and I are viewed as righteous in the sight of God, the full consummation of that righteousness will only be when we're in glory. So I think that's kind of what he's kind of getting at. He's, it's almost like he's always pressing us to think eternally. This is where your true citizenship is. It's, a, it's, a, it's the city of God, you know. So. All right, in the room? No, back to the magic square. 
Michael Hill, can you further develop the relationship between the, quote, body of Christ, end quote, that was physically resurrected and the, quote, body of Christ, end quote, as the composite of believers? Yeah. Why are we said to be the, quote, body of Christ, end quote? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the, um, the, the, there is, um, interestingly enough, those two metaphors are, one's a metaphor, one's a reality, right? The, body of, the, the physical body of Christ was actually literally resurrected. Okay, so that's undeniably biblical. There's another, but there's another mention of the word body, which is a metaphor, and that is Christians in a corporate covenantal setting, i.e. the church. So those things are both there in the Bible, independently, all right? But they're both used, and the same word is, is used. I think the Greek word is soma, if I'm not mistaken. So they're both there. What's interesting, though, is sometimes it gets confusing as to which one is being talked about. For example, when we, talk, when we do the Lord's Supper and we talk about the, discern, the discerning of the Lord's body, right? people taking in an unworthy manner, and they're not discerning the Lord's body. Wh which one are they talking about there? A lot of people hold that view. It's his resurrected body. That because you're like, it's bread and wine, right? And so that's the topic of the sacrament, is the body of Christ, the actual physical body of Christ. But, but, if you're reading what the problem is in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, the problem is they're ignoring each other, right? People are getting drunk. People are get, not getting their share. He's kind of going, look, at you go, if, if you want to eat and more, you want to drink, go home and do it. And the problem is that they were neglecting not the communion, not merely the communion with God, but the communion with one another. So a very strong argument is made that the real problem at Corinth wasn't that they were not thinking about the physical body of Jesus. The problem in context was they were not considering the body of Christ as it was expressed in the church at Corinth. Really strong arguments are made on both sides of that. I've heard really compelling arguments on both sides of that. So sometimes it gets confusing as to, well, what body is he talking about? But it's only, but it's never confusing in such a way as to negatively affect your theology. I mean, I, I guess it could, in the Corinthian passage, have application. I do think you should be doing both. I think we should really be meditating upon the res, you know, the, the Christ's body, his, his blood his physical body, but I also think we should be doing it together. So, you know, you, get, you cover both those bases. Hold on. All right, if there's, some, if there's, because we want to go to new people first, even here. Can you tell me, how, to, how would you pronounce that name? Uh, I've never, Kenny okay. Murrett. Yeah, Murrett. Sorry. We're going to go with, Kenny Murrett, sorry, Kenny, if that's not the right pronunciation. Could you expand on what the biblical writers are saying when they use the term, quote, the whole world, end quote? If clearly, not, if clearly not every single, then what are they attempting to communicate with this phrase? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And, for example, when they said, you know, these guys are turning the whole world upside down, right? which is another place that it's used, or the whole world follows him. or it's, it's hyperbolic, right? They're trying to make a point. They're kind of going, you know, you're, you're disrupting everything. Mm. Really, everything? I mean, because if I really want to analyze everything, you're not really disrupting everything, but a lot of things. And so um, oftentimes it'll be used to just demonstrate, like, hyperbole. It's like a, when Paul says your faith is being, I rejoice that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world, which there is a different word, by the way. 
but equally interesting because the word there is cosmos, you know, and hmm. which we all know to mean like the cosmos, but not. It's just a matter of the way we would use it, I think, to kind of emphatically state something that's taking place. So those are the reasons, various reasons. But that, at the same time, if you look at my notes and I said in the sermon, it doesn't necessarily mean that because there are, there are times and the context has to demand it where it may in fact mean the whole world. I mean, you, got, you, just, you just have to do your homework on the individual verses passages in order to draw those conclusions. Yeah, Bill. In uh, end of life discussions with people, um, one of the things that's often said is um, the reminder that you will pass through the portal of time and stand in front of the one that made you. From a biblical standpoint and um, a timing standpoint, the sequence, uh, if somebody said theologically, what actually does happen? How would you describe that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, it's funny. I, I don't know that I'm, I've used that, you know, portal of time language. Um, the thing that we need to recognize I, is that um, God is eternal. God is above. He's, he's transcendent, you know. And you and I aren't. And we never will be. We, we, when we die, we don't become um, deities. We'll, we'll always be subject to the creation, which includes time and space and what have you. I would say, you know, in all the theological topics that I have in my whole life tackled, whether it's Calvinism or postmillennialism or what have you, I would argue, and Greg Bonson would be behind me on this, that there may not be a more difficult topic than the, um, the state of man after death before the resurrection. That may be the most difficult concept to get our arms around because we don't want to become platonic, right? We're, we're kind of going, we're separating the body from the soul, you know. Yet at the same time, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so in a certain sense, in a certain sense, we're present with God. And... Um, and what does that look like? And what does that feel like? And I mean, I'm a, I'm a disembodied spirit in the presence of God. So many, ga not games, but so many, so many things have been postulated, right? Soul sleep and, you know, on and on, you know. So are this immediate jettisoning into the future of the final resurrection and this and that. And I don't want to go beyond the text because you don't really see a lot in the Bible about that. I think it is fair, though, to use language that, you know, and I'll say something like, to, you know, our first breath, our last breath on earth will be followed by our first breath in the presence of God. And somebody will go, well, if we're disembodied, we're not really breathing, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I'll close my eyes here and open them in the presence of God. Well, are you going to have eyes? And so forth, you know. But that, I still think that's a fair way to present it, even though it's very hard for me to get my arms around what my soul, apart from my body, actually is. Hebrews uses it as an example of that which is unsearchable when it talks about the Word of God able to go between body and soul, you know, penetrating where you're kind of going, what is that? And I think he's using that because he knows in a way, nobody knows the answer. Like, that's as deep as you can get in terms of, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin kind of, kind of question, you know. Um, I just know that at whatever it is. And I, I mean, what is it like to, um, to be in the presence of God? I mean, that, I, I can conceive of what it's like to be in the presence of the resurrected Christ. I can kind of get there. 
to be in the presence of the eternal simplicity of God? I mean, the, the simplicity of God means that all of God is everywhere all the time. God is not complex. He doesn't have a hand, he doesn't have eyes. There's not, he doesn't have parts the way you and I have parts. The idea of me standing before God is, I think it's incomprehensible. I don't, I don't think we can get there. Yeah, follow up. The follow up would be um, the aspect of, of after death, there's the holding pattern, you know, before the dead are raised and, and uh, that whole subject. Um, how would that be articulated to someone who is looking at that, those final hours in, in life? Yeah, I, um, I don't know that I'd go anywhere else other than the, they will be in the presence of God. They, you know, if they're a believer, they will be in the presence of their Heavenly Father. Now, I'm, I'm trusting that for the believer, that'll be pretty good. That'll be a good thing. And I think that the language used in the Bible is so glorious, but it falls short of the reality that it's allegorically, metaphorically trying to, you know, teach us about. Um, I, I did a, you know, I do a lot of funerals, and I did one just recently, and I, I realized that even when I'm talking about a person who's never made a profession of faith, and I don't know where they're, if they're in the favored presence of God, or if they are in the disfavored presence of God. But I realized that I can say that they're in the hands of God. Now that may be good or that may be bad, but that's where they are. And it's, you know what, it's really, that's now just between them and God and there's nothing we can do about it other than us right now thinking about what it's gonna be for us, which is why we're here in a funeral. We're not there to pray them out of purgatory. We're here to consider our own mortality. And so I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't go too far into a description other than there, there's nothing in this world, their greatest moment, the greatest single precious glorious moment of their life will, will seem like nothing compared to be, being in the favored presence of their Heavenly Father. And I, I think we go with that, go with that. That's what I want to hear when I'm breathing my last breath, you know? Because whoever, unless, I mean, who's poetic enough to get me there, you know? That's why you, it's not that I won't talk about hell or heaven, but whenever I'm talking in a sermon about hell or heaven, it's, it's those two topics that I feel like I just don't have what it takes. You know, I mean, the closest we're going to get is sinners in the hands of an angry God, right? I mean, if you're talking about hell, one of these Sundays, and I have it, I have it at home, one of these Sundays, I will come here and I will read Edward's sermon to our congregation because I simply can't, but I am like, it ministers to me in a very intense way. Um, but, but you always fall short of that. You know, which is good, and I'm glad we do. I'm glad we fall short. Can you imagine if somebody was able to tell me, I'll, I mean, it'd be like, really? Because I'm pretty sure I'd be disappointed, you know, just with their description of it. All right? All right. Anonymous, anonymous. My cousin's husband died recently. Since then, she has been experiencing unexplainable things in her home such as water splashes on the bathroom mirror, hand and footprints on bed pillows and bath mats, appliances turning on by themselves, clocks and personal items being moved, recliners reclining on their own, etc. She is a nominal Catholic, but believes this is her husband's spirit. A, quote, medium, end quote, friends of hers, friend of hers, has stated that this is my cousin's husband's spirit, not, quote, crossed over, end quote, yet. Can you explain biblically what this might be 
and what I, as a Christian, can say or do to convey the truth to her. Yeah. Well, biblically, I don't think there's any warrant for a person's spirit to be like hanging out in, in a house or, or what have you. Um, th- there is a, you know, there is a, a great chasm fix between the two and there, you don't go from one to the other. And so um, this would be, in terms of that person, spirit doing this, pure fiction. I mean, you're not going to find an example of that. What you can't, what you might find, though, an example of, and I do believe in, the Bible teaches in demonic spirits, you know, de- you know demonic beings. That's a reality. That's a biblical reality. And, um, and so that's, and if that's a, I guess, you know, at least potentially something that could be happening. And if that's the case, then it's just a matter of, you know, clinging to Christ and recognizing greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Um, but I don't think, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, I can find a verse that says, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so's spirit, disembodied body doesn't go into houses or something like that. But there's certainly none that says that it does. And every indication of people who've died find themselves, you know, in the presence of of God. So when you're not here, you're in the presence of God, you know, not really hanging out in certain earthly venues. All right. Nobody else in the room here? All right, we got about two or three minutes left. Uh, Seth, are you raising your hand? Or? Okay, Arnie, somebody has given you. You know, um, I remember talking to you earlier before you started your Revelation series, and the one thing it seemed like we both agreed on that uh, a lot of the symbols in Revelation are already esta- uh, identified in the Old Testament. Right. And I think that's a, I, I agree in many ways, and I think that, because that kind of clears up a lot of this make up things on the spur of the moment, whereas, hey, we got, and I think there's one that, uh, unless I was napping during the sermon or something, but when you were talking about the, about, the, when, you know, um, Jesus, where he's talking about having the keys of David, right? Right. And saying no one opens and no, and, you know, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, and I think there's an Old Testament passage it actually uses that phrase. Yeah, it's uh, Isaiah 22. 22. Okay, did you talk about that in the yeah. sermon? And I, I apologize. Yeah, I that's all right. It was a very it. long sermon today. I know. Everybody I know, was. But, uh, what do you mean okay, you very know? good. Then I, I guess I'll just <laughs> shut up at this point. You caught uh, that quick. Uh, <laughs> but well, actually, I did have one other thing since I um, messed up on that question. Um, uh, I was looking at the Greek in about that phrase in um, when you're. Uh, what was it, Luke chapter 2 about uh, the, the Caesar? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, yeah. I mean, the word, the taking word a, whole Taking world. a sensor of the whole of And the I whole just world. thought it was kind of interesting. The word, I'm, I'm guess I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but right. uh, it's the Strong's Greek word, and of course this is going crazy. It's changing the, the whole inhabited whole world. And um, yeah, and I guess it's debated because it's, it's the inhabited earth, and the general oh, yeah. agreement is that it's not talking about the whole world, and the, it was basically... I guess the Roman world was considered the only world because the barbarians were even considered almost like second class, not even people almost. Right. And uh, so I guess I was just trying to argue that uh, that uh, it wasn't an exaggeration that word, but I'm just trying to defend my own position. Yeah. But yeah. well, you know, the the language in the Bible is a little more liquid than a lot of us are comfortable with, and some of us would be shocked when you kind of look at a word. I remember when I was taking Greek going, oh, well, I wonder why they translated this word here, because it's the same word there, and they're using an entirely different word, and you realize that translators um, are doing a lot of translation based upon their understanding of what texts mean rather than just word for word, which would make the Bible very hard to read. That's, New American Standard is generally pretty good, which is why it's hard to read, and yet, they're, like I had mentioned earlier, that all the, uh, all the translators of the New American Standard were dispensationalists. And so they're gonna, that's going to play into it, you know. But here's the deal about words in the Bible, and that is 
that if we're going to follow the primary hermeneutic of the Reformed hermeneutic, which is the analogy of faith, that is number one on our list. That is, Scripture interprets Scripture, right? I think we need to apply that to linguistics. In other words, my understanding of what a word means in the Bible has to first and, for, first and foremost be interpreted by how that word is actually used elsewhere in the Bible. And so that would include this word as well. That if Luke is using the word this way, which clearly can't be referring to every last single person in every last place on earth, then that needs to go pretty high on my list of priorities in terms of how I'm going to actually understand that word. And then you have a breadth of the you have the breadth of the length, you have a linguistic breadth, and you're going, now I've got kind of like um, a number of ways that I am allowed to use that word. We don't want to do that to cater to our theology, but at the same time, we need to recognize that we don't want to be hemmed in by a word that's not hemming us in, if that makes sense. All right, last question, Seth. I don't know if somebody else is. There's more, yeah. Mm. Oh, are those all today? Yeah. Okay, we'll go a couple more minutes. Okay. What time are we meeting? One. One, okay. I'll be quick. Okay. Um, in our, our final of the membership vows, um, uh, we agree to submit to church discipline in case we should be found wanting in life or doctrine. Right. That's the phrase. Um, uh, as for the scope of being caught or found delinquent in doctrine, um, it uh, arose in a discussion with a fellow believer that uh, as uh, we do subscribe to secondary and tertiary standards, the strictest courtroom, you know, the, like a legal argument approaching that could lead to the interpretation that we could be disciplined or you know, undergo church discipline for disagreeing with the tertiary standards or you know, a, a smaller thing that isn't you know, a direct uh, contradiction to the Bible, or, you know, which might be up for debate, yeah. um, which is not how I, I had interpreted that, but you know, it was interesting to see uh, see it seen from that angle. But uh, if you would just uh, comment on kind of the scope of what would qualify being uh, being delinquent in doctrine when uh, when we have secondary and tertiary standards that we acknowledge as not being canon or right. you know, inerrant. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and it's 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 difficult because to like be overly specific because we tend to think of heresies or life doctrine, somebody denying the Trinity, you know, they deny the physical resurrection of Christ or what have you, and we're all kind of ready to do battle there because even though that's a violation of our secondary standards, clearly it's a violation of our initial primary standard, the scriptures. So, you know, there's no big argument there. Uh, but then, recognizing this, that our secondary, primary, second, I mean, I guess the tertiary standards would come to play in, like, uh, the Book of Order, you know. And so, you know, if people started coming into our elders' meetings and howling like a dog during the meeting, they'd, that'd probably be a, somewhat of a violation of our tertiary standards. There's no verse in the Bible that says, don't go to the elders' meeting and howl like a dog. And so they're like, they're, where in the Bible does it say I can't howl like a dog? And then we'd be like, okay. And if they don't stop, I could see the tertiary standard being the basis for division and the lack of respect for the leadership in the church and on and on. But you, some things are very easy. Other things are not very easy. Some things are intense. Some things aren't very intense. You know, I mean... Um, if somebody, I mean, we, we, we had to discipline somebody for gossip. I mean, and they just wouldn't stop, you know, but you're like going, gossip, doesn't everybody kind of do that? Well, yeah, I think a lot of people do. You catch yourself, but when you're confronted, you repent, and this person wouldn't repent, they just kept doing it and so forth. Um, but you ultimately, well, here's the deal. The person who is being disciplined has the opportunity, say this gets pushed, right? They have the opportunity to defend themselves and they will be given counsel. Somebody who's like going, I'm gonna defend you because this church is wrong. Their position is in discord with the scriptures themselves. 
they would have to now make the argument. And, um, and oftentimes it is through trials that some of the greatest things happen. You know, I mean, the greatest events and worst events in history and in the church were a result of trials that took place. So a trial would have to happen to determine whether or not the secondary and tertiary standards are even biblical. And then the church, the church, because our very standards say synods and councils do err. They make mistakes. That somebody could, hypothetically could go, this is one of those errors. And um, I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon here, but that's kind of where that would go. You know, because only the scriptures can bind the conscience. So it would be up to us as a church to kind of show that that is unbiblical, not just us. I don't, I'm uncomfortable when people only appeal to the standards. That makes me uncomfortable. I think the standards should be appealed to um, for a couple of reasons. One is they say it better than I say it. So I'm like, you know, but I've, I'm on a passage in the Bible Here's what I think it says, and here's how our standard puts it. And then you're like, oh, no, I see where that came from. But if I just go, here's the standard, and you come up to me and you go, well, where is that in the Bible? And, I'd be, and I said, well, it's in the standard, so it doesn't need to be in the Bible. Mm-hmm. I think that's shaky ground. And that happens. That does happen. Well, and the OPC doesn't practice confessional membership either. So. Right, so... So you're you know, not even bound to the subordinate standards in the way Right, unless you're becoming a deacon or exactly, an elder. Yeah. Exactly. All right, uh, real quickly, because we got to go. What do we got down here? The, anything there really interesting? Sorry, okay. those of you who, and we got a lot of questions, so sorry, we have an elders meeting at one, so um, I've, got a, I've got a hard deadline here. Want me to Maybe try to somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Waiting okay. for that one. Okay, Paul, yeah. Could you uh, define, you use the term theological tamale. Could you define exactly <laughs> what that means? A big tamale hanging out there? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. I hope everybody got it, though. It's just one of those things where you're like, I don't know, you're like going, what? What in the world? You know, I mean, you just, I, I you just read that. I, I'm like, oh, I wonder what people think about this. And I had forgotten, you know, that they're going to be kept from the trial. And I'm looking at that going, I wonder, you know, how that's being put. And then all of a sudden I start reading that it's the uh, rapture. And I'm like, the church, of, the church at Philadelphia wasn't raptured. And, and so that just isn't working. I mean, you've just got to make that work. And that is a big, giant tamale hanging out there. Now I'm getting hungry. All right, nothing here that's just jumping out at you? Oh, that, I think this one. All right, it's last a, one. It's and, a little long. And I, I apologize, and maybe if you, maybe we'll have these next week, and Grant can't answer them, because Grant's doing the exhortation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Daniel Tavern, Qu- yeah. quoting your sermon from this morning, quote, but I, think that it, I, but I think that is a very unhealthy thing for the church and for the people that we're going to seek to minister to, to think that anybody has a special place in God's covenant by the virtue of the blood flowing through their veins, end quote. You mentioned this regarding the ethnic Jew, but don't we as Presbyterians hold that our children, by the virtue of the, quote, blood flowing through their veins, end quote, should be regarded as having a special place in God's covenant, Matthew 3, verse 9, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Right. Question, if the Jews had no claim to salvation by nature of their relationship to Abraham, why do we give that preferential status to our children in baptism based on their relationship to us as professing members of the covenant? If you say that blood has no bearing on covenant status, why should our children be any different? Can my daughter, Novare? I think I said that right. As an effect of her baptism, say that she is a daughter of Abraham or daughter of the covenant simply by virtue of her father and mother being children of Abraham. Yeah, that's a good question. So let's make this clear. The, um, the parents are part of the covenant by faith, not by blood. Right? So they're part of the covenant by faith, 
not by blood, and their children are included in the covenant by virtue of their relationship with their parent, but which is what we saw in the old covenant as well. But, but if there's no faith in the parents, none of them are in the covenant. So you are, you are, see the argument that I'm, what I'm arguing against is that there are people in this world who will kind of look at their DNA regardless of their association with the covenant people of God and view themselves as in covenant with God, even though they're not in that kingdom that Jesus described, like he says, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you and given to another bearing the fruit thereof. And the, that fruit, first and foremost, would be initiated by God-given faith. Now, once you have that God-given faith, now you kind of go, well, how does this community function? Where do we do with the kids? Well, the kids, by virtue of the faith of their parents, are considered by Paul as holy. But it doesn't have anything to do with like blood flow from generation to generation to generation. It has to do with the faith of the parents, not the blood of the parents. And I think that's a big distinction that needs to be made. Because, it, by the way, it's not even the blood. You can have adopted kids. You could have, it's the members of your household, yeah. which at the time could have been servants and so forth. And so it, it really, the blood is incidental. If I, have, if I have children that I've adopted and I'm kind of the covenantal head of the household, they're, and they, they're, they're part of this church, we consider them to be one of us by virtue of their relationship with one, the parents who have faith, not the parents who have blood. All right, hopefully that answers that question. Sorry again for all of those I couldn't get to. We'll get to them next time, hopefully. All right.